Okay, next speaker, we've got uh, John Quinn. Uh, he's a presentologist. Probably going to show me a few tips now then. Uh, from Audience Alive. Uh, John was raised and educated in Ireland. Uh, he arrived in Dubai in 1996, determined to make the difference between presentations that fell flat and that sealed the deal. After several years with Philips Middle East, he started Audience Alive Dubai and then in 2015 expanded the operation to beautiful Queenstown. I'm a bit jealous there. Jeez, that's a nice place. Audience Alive combines uh, design and leading edge presentation technology to take visual communication to a whole new level. They can design a custom template that your company can use or they can produce an app for your event from start to finish. They also help with advice on delivery and presentation training. John. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. High five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, kia ora koto, and welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. My name's Johnny, as you heard there, and I'm a presentologist. Have you met one of those before? No? First time? Uh, yeah, presentology is something that people really haven't heard much about. And uh, I heard this week it's called a portmanteau, where you join two words together, like uh, smog or, you know, podcast. Those are, those are the words. And it was actually a CEO who called us presentologist yeah so he came up with the concept and it's kind of stuck so if I was to sum up presentology in one image then this would be it uh, what do you see here is this a typical audience they're pretty engaged aren't they there's a handshake going on so a deal's been done yeah so some something good's happened yeah but is this typical very often if you think about it presentations are the visible difference between you and your competition Yet we see people presenting numbers with too much density in them. So what I thought I'd go through today is really just try to show you, you know, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom, maybe, and look at some of the differences and show you some examples of where people have taken numbers and really presented them in, a, in an interesting and more diverse way. And we thought we'd look through some of those as we went through. Starting off with a list of bullet points turned into an infographic. Here we have some of the numbers around my industry. So a huge amount of presentations go on every day somewhere in the world, about 350 going on every second somewhere. A huge amount of companies do not review how they're doing it and are they doing it well and are they really connecting with the audience. So there's a massive improvement if you do it well. Yeah? So you can get much more information across and improve that if you present better and if you get the information across and present the numbers in a more effective way. On the right hand side there you see that if you create an engagement with people and we've seen some great engagements today then you know it's a way of getting your message across. So does everyone remember what Agile is an onion? Do you remember that? It was just a minute ago wasn't it? Agile is an onion? That's what I got out of it. Yeah I got this image of an onion so why did it stick in my mind? Yeah and ask yourself where do those, why do you get connected in that way? So those are some of just the general numbers, but looking at how we create things and how we put things together, we really did, you've heard of disruption, we need to disrupt and change the norm. Now this is the norm, if I was to come up here today and say to you, you know, today we're going to talk about making better presentations and uh, then we're going to talk about improving how you present it maybe, would you be as engaged? Yeah, I mean is this, think about this slide, ask yourself, why do you recognize it as a PowerPoint slide? It's got a title, hasn't it? Right up at the top up there. It's got a title at the top. It's got a list of bullet points. Yeah, I'm probably going to read them, aren't I? Yeah, but you'll have read them before me because you, you read at 300 words per second or per minute and I, I can kind of talk at 150 words per minute. So you'll have read the last one and then I've got on with whatever you're doing, yeah, or thinking about something else. So how do you make them more engaging, yeah? What about the picture on the right-hand side? Picture has been nicked off the internet, hasn't it? It's a stock image, yeah? It's got a crappy uh, treatment to it, which is called a reflection just down the bottom. And my logo that I love and spent a lot of time is stuck down in the bottom right-hand corner, lost and forlorn. So I haven't really spent much effort on this. And it sort of says, you know, I don't really care, yeah? So this is normally why I end up presenting at the end of most days because nobody wants to go on after a presentologist, right? So this is, if you want to be the same as everyone else, then just do this. Yeah, that, that's how it, that works. But everything I'm going to show you as we go through our session today is stuff that people have tried something different. 
and we're going to look at how we create something different that actually makes an impact. But before we do that, how do we actually distill the information and what, what do we need to do before we actually start working on slides and putting content together? So we'll look at, look at those as we go through. The problem is that people won't tell you you're not good at this. Yeah. You know, better presenters move faster through organizations, but it's, it amazes me that there's no real review of this, yeah, in terms of presentation quality and style and how you're actually doing it. So we need to kind of try and, you know, open that. And this is one of my favorite quotations around presentations generally. <laughs> we all have that feeling of ownership, don't we? We all kind of, it's our, our child. We, we spawned it. We, we created it. Yeah, it's, it's ours, yeah? So, I mean, like, nobody's going to admit to having ugly children, you know? So at the end of the day, you've got to think, you know, how can I improve this? And then, obviously, conferences and events. Have you heard of death by PowerPoint? Yeah? Have you had any death by PowerPoint over the next past couple of days? I don't know. Hopefully, this session won't be. But uh, yeah, so death by PowerPoint is a, is a con concept that's been around for a while. These guys are suffering a bit of it at the moment. And this gentleman, Adam Management Accountant Conference, <laughs> believe it or not, back of the room, 400 people in front of him. And he's nipped down to the back to have a little ziz. Now, maybe flown in from. Australia or somewhere, and this is in Dubai, and he's had a long, hasn't had much sleep. But what amazed me about this guy is um, when they announced the CEO, he kind of shook himself and went up to the front of the room. So the CEO of a management accounting firm, who shall remain nameless, asleep at the back of his own event. That's how unengaged he is, yeah, with what's going on. Similarly, this lady came all the way from the States. She's in the back row there. And she brought her own entertainment, yeah? So we're seeing more and more people turning up at events and really you know, being prepared to be disengaged. So how do we create more engagement at live events or at conferences or events such as this? Well, we've got to stop doing this, don't we? I mean, these are real slides from real customers. Can you improve this one for me, Johnny, they said? I said, hell yes, I can delete it and start again. I mean, like, what's, what's wrong with it? What's right with it? Yeah, very little's right with it. Yeah, poor use of graphics, fonts, colors, pretty much everything wrong. This is what happens if you give an intern the job of producing your slides. Yeah, so, and you might think that that's extreme. Yeah, okay, because when did you really focus on this? When's the last time you really learned something about how to present visual communication better? Probably you did a dissertation at college, but have you ever, I've just spent, three days with a team from MBIE teaching them how to do this better. And they're all very intelligent people, but they have never really been told that you've got this tool called PowerPoint, and if you use it badly, then it really does kill the whole presentation. So how do you create more impact? And it's a case of learning that and learning how to do it better. Similarly, you might think, you know, well, what's wrong with this? I recognize it right away. Do you recognize those shape? Yeah, the pyramid, yeah. Or the Roman, the Roman temple, yeah, that one's in there. Or the ark, or the... the the curved arrow, yeah, those are all cliches in terms of visual communication. People are going to switch off as soon as you use them. Now, these guys, if you look hard enough, you can see who it is. And they said to me, you know, what do you think of this? And I said, well, what are you trying to get across here? And you're taking this internally? It's for an internal meeting? No, no, no. This is going externally at a conference. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. Come on. I mean, well, what? they said, we get this, but what do you get from it? And I said, well, Smarties and M&Ms is probably where I'm going with this. So, you know, sometimes you've got to step back. You've got a helicopter back, haven't you? And look at really you're too close to the whole thing, and you're not seeing that the message isn't getting across because it's too dense. There's too much going on, and that can be the challenge. So let's look at how we create a story that actually has some impact. And this is a, a great quote as well that kind of sums up that really, you know, you can know a lot about your subject, but if you can't put it into a story, and you know, us Irish people are, we enjoy a good story, yeah, so you've got to have some sort of story, a story around the numbers, a story of what you're going to keep trying to communicate. And very often we see people dive straight into, let's do a mind map, let's do a, you know, let's do a, and a mind map would be a good start, but most people start right into PowerPoint. Let's start building slides, yeah, okay? But maybe you should think that let's not do something digital, let's, you know, start on the blank piece of paper and work out what are we trying to get to, Where, what's the structure and what, what's message are we trying to get across? And just 
to give you a scope or a sort of framework of that, this is a typical, you know, if, if on the far right hand side, if I'm delivering my presentation, then I'll have rehearsed beforehand and I'll have worked on, on actually practicing that in terms of delivering it. And then we'll have built slides in there somewhere. But the lion's share of the work gets done over in that first third there, yeah. And I mean, like, you wouldn't say you're going to spend an hour per slide, are you? But I mean, in terms of actually putting it together, if you were really going to create impact, that is the amount of time you'd need to spend on it. Certainly, who's the best presenters you've ever seen before? Would you be Steve Jobs be up there, for example? Jobs, not a nice person, but a great pre pre presentation, if you believe the stories, but a great presenter. He would have spent that amount of time practicing. And we'll touch on him as we go through, because three seems to be a, a number that works really well in presentations. I mean, if you think about it, white mice, you know, the, uh, the Three Stooges, you know, Three Kings, for example, yeah. They're, they're kind of taught to us all the way through. Traffic lights, there are three of them. And to this day, I still don't know where three really comes from and why it's so impactful. But if you can, in Toastmasters, it's called a triad, talking about three things. So if you can talk, bring your numbers down to, I'm just going to talk about three things today. It might be three groups of five things, yeah, but in terms of breaking it down, three is a really good number in terms of getting your message across and putting the content together. Also, you know, here's an example of just a slide with three in it. So we're just talking about three different things here. If we were, and we did add a fourth one, it kind of lost its impact. So it's really a case of trying to make more impact with them in terms of putting it together. Don't be afraid to do this because really, you know, if you're looking at just getting your message across, if you look at the content that's on the slides, and let's be clear about this, I'm talking about a presentation to be given at a conference or a presentation to be stood up or not a report. And we are seeing people using presentations to give out as a handout. And that's a different presentation to standing up and talking to people. And very often we try to have one size fitting all. And that doesn't work sometimes. You've got the notes pages down there. That's where all the dense data should be going. Yeah, it shouldn't necessarily be going up on the screen. You can give it away to people and you can allow them to download it and I will make sure you get all these slides at the end of the day, but you should not necessarily have it all up on the screen. If you want to make simple comments and think about tweeting it, thinking about SMSing it, just condensing the information and I'll give you some more guides for that as we go through. You know, in terms of, that's, that's one of our mantras in terms of communicating. I've worked with so many CEOs and different types of C-level, C-suite people over the years, and they all come back to this simple concept of, can we just keep it really simple? One idea per slide. Try not to overdo the amount of information. Try not to overdo the amount, bottom line figures only. We're not necessarily after all the density. So we'll look at some examples of those as we go through. But my, if you can hear my accents from Belfast and Northern Ireland, and if I go back to my real Belfast accent, that's what it sounds like. And we have a lot of bullets there. And I'm from Belfast, and I'm trying to ban the bullet point, OK? So we're trying to get rid of the bullets, yeah, OK? So that round white or black dot, or the tick, or the X, or whatever you're using, is actually a bit of a challenge. Because as soon as people see it, they think it's PowerPoint and switch off and stop listening to you. So if you can get rid of the bullet point, Steve Jobs never used one of them, ever. So if you can get rid of the bullet point, but what do you replace the bullet point with? Well, the simple idea there is to replace it with an image, with an icon, one of the simplest images you can use, an icon of some sort. So get rid of the bullet points and add more icons, and that immediately ties it together. So that's when we'll look at some examples of that. If we do use an image, then it's called this. It's called picture superiority effect, not the Gangnam style sigh, but uh, that's one. And I mean, like, so if you think about a word, an actual word and how we take the word and actually then move it over into an image and then to a logo, for example, the brain is much more efficient at processing the imagery than it is at processing the word. In fact, the words are in our brain are seen as images. Do you believe that? Are words images? Are letters images? Well, we start off with A, B, C, don't we? And we start off with picture of an apple and then we learn a p p l e so it's a case of do we link images to our mind and how are they used so as i said it's called that and we try to tell stories with it yeah if we're going to use an image then tell some stories with it so it's been proven that you're six and a half times more likely to get your message across with imagery as opposed to using the text so just as a test with that i'll give you a little rest it's after lunch just Rest your eyes, close your eyes, and think of your mobile phone number backwards in your mind. 
pretty hard, isn't it? Think of your mobile phone number backwards in your mind. Now, while you're thinking of that, think of a blue tree. A blue tree. A blue tree. And now ask yourself, which one of those two things is easier? Is it easier to think of your mobile phone number backwards or the blue tree? Um, I'm in dangerous territory here because I've, uh, I've got some very analytical people here. They're maybe, oh, mobile phone number was easy. But most humans, I've found, are much see a blue tree as an image in your mind. And that's much easier to convey. And the image jumps forward in your mind over the analytical numbers. So trying to get through the numbers can be difficult. So six and a half times more likely. And the brain, actually, when it sees text, is confused and sees it as a jumbled mass of you know, information. It's much better when you, when you use some sort of imagery with it. Again, if you'd like to, a bit of proof, go ahead, read this. You can read it out loud if you want. This message serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things, impressive things. In the beginning, it was hard, but now on this line, your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking about it. Be proud, only certain people can read this. True? I think most of you can probably read it, yeah? So it's, the brain sees it. We can mix them up, and the brain actually can work really well at, at, at breaking it down. Now, the other thing we try to get people to focus in on is if you've got numbers to talk about, if you've got something, then, you know, people want this type of information. They want all of the information that you're going to communicate with them, yeah? So the, this is an example of a piece of a slide that would have been given to Steve Jobs at the launch of the MacBook Air. But people want this stuff, and it should be given out as a handout. But did, Jobs, did Steve Jobs stand up and present this? No way. Yeah, what, what did he do? Does anyone remember back to the launch of the MacBook Air? He did something quite dramatic. No, he actually put a picture of it up there, but then he removed the MacBook Air from an envelope. So we used a prop to actually show how thin it was. And we've seen many of the best presentations throughout history have got some element of props in them. Uh, Bill Gates, who is not a great presenter, but his crowning moment was when he was talking about malaria and he had a CD case and he opened it up and let some mosquitoes go in the audience. Well, there were no mosquitoes in there, but he was doing it for effect. And he said, you know, it's not only poor people who should have the experience, you know. So he brought some mosquitoes and that was a moment for him. So what prop could you bring to a um, you know, management accountant meeting where you're talking about numbers? Yeah, so what could you bring that would actually represent? So we see people bringing brains, for example. We're talking about brain power. Are you talking about learning? Bring a little brain. You know, you can get something 3D printed, for example. So you could make up a, an object and get it printed. So props, are, props get people connected all the time. Now, talking about numbers and jobs, I've, would, you would see him pr produce something like this, an iPod, and he would never refer to it as a five gigabyte MP3 player, because that's what it was, yeah? What he called it, he built a story around it. He called it a thousand songs in your pocket. So that's really the difference, if you think about it, of taking a number and then telling a story with the number. Yeah? And that's what we kind of need to learn how to do. How do we tell a story around a number, and how can we break that down? So, because you're really releasing emotions in people. Yeah, when you do this, yeah? If you do it well. And it's the one time in your life you're allowed to be a drug dealer. Does anybody know what the drug is of, of memory or emotions? There's a particular drug that, make, that will make people, if you make people feel something, if you get them connected, then they automatically get releases, released in you, and it's dopamine. Dopamine and serotonin will do this. Yeah, so you will absolutely be memorable to people when they remember something. So I know Agile is an onion because it released something in me when, when the previous speaker was referring to it, because it connected with me. I saw the image of the onion, and it connected me. I'll probably remember that for much longer than a lot of other things, because there's an image and a story attached to it, which is where it gets connected. Now, talking about stories, you all have a lot of knowledge. Do you know this? Did you know this? Yeah? You did know this, yeah. But that's, that's the knowledge. That's great knowledge. And I see a huge amount of people with knowledge but they don't necessarily have a lot of wisdom. And what we're paying you for, and what we want you to be, is wise. So I see that this difference between the two is really important. It's not necessarily, we don't want all of the data as an audience. We actually want your wisdom of what's important from it. 
because I could sit up here and produce reams and reams of bulleted lists to give to you, but that's, I'm trying to distill down what you really, is the key messages behind it. So the best way I can show you that is to tell you a story. I'm on the top of a very tall building with 3,000 people in it, with a sea level, up at the CEO, and he's very, very angry. And we're in a meeting, and he's not angry with me, he's angry with his marketing department, because they have given him this slide to talk about the amount of data growth throughout the Middle East, throughout, throughout the world. And he's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of questioning him, what's, what's wrong with this slide? What is wrong with it? And he said, it's just too much information. You know, they want me to talk about this bit in the blue here, the Middle East and North Africa. They want me to sort of highlight that. And, you know, it's not got any story to it at all. It's data, but, and it's knowledge, but it's got no wisdom in it. And I said, so what's your wisdom? What's, what will be your story about this? And he went on, and we then went on to create these slides for him. And what he went on to tell me was, imagine a Maasai warrior in Africa with an old Nokia phone. He has access, believe it or not, to more information than Ronald Reagan did during his entire tenure as president. If we give him a smartphone, he has access to more information than Clinton did. Now, there's a difference between two completely different methods of communication. The first one, data heavy and lots of information and very valuable and let's give it out and let's allow people to have it. The second one, telling a story around that data and really possibly creating more impact by communicating it. So this guy was off to do a TED talk on data. So it was that kind of level. So I'm not putting the data down. We need the data and the data is great and people have a lot of value in it, but how do we deliver it is really important in terms of how we get the message across. I'll just leave that one there, yeah? So how do we visualize the data? And let me show you some examples um, just so that you can kind of get a measure of what we do and how we do it and sort of before and after. So this is a Christchurch company. This is what was given to us. This is the before. He's talking about traveling and going around the world and sort of where the market, where the market demographics are, what do you do with it. It's a demographic slide. It needs a map, doesn't it? So this is what we did to it. So it's a before and after. The data is there, but then we present the data in a different way. Now, some people might say, but I want to see the different percentages. Those can be on the notes pages, but in terms of just getting it across, in terms of how you get it across is two different ways. What would you do with something like this? Big number. We've got to celebrate it, don't we? So we've got to make it big. Let's make it big. So what we did with it is make it as large as possible. 200 point font. Yeah, bring in an infographic, bring an icon in, make it more visually appealing. So that's using the picture superiority effect and the number together to create more impact. And by the way, everything you're looking at is PowerPoint here. There's nothing, not plugins, there's no nothing. This is just using PowerPoint in a better way. Tables and graphs, everybody needs tables and graphs, don't they? Yeah, but what do you do with something like this? It's a real, just screams PowerPoint, isn't it? You, you're like, that's a PowerPoint table, I get it, no problem. So what do you do with it? Well, we delete it. We actually get the data out of it. We don't do something completely different with it and bring some shapes in, use some icons and make it much bigger. Yeah, let's use the font size. So we have a rule around presenting in, in, in our presentations. It's called the 10, 20, 30 rule of presenting. 10 slides or 10 points delivered in 20 minutes, which I'm, com which I'm coming past now, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'll be finishing soon. 20 minutes, and what's 30? 30 is the minimum font size. If you see a presentation that has a smaller font than size 30, it's likely that the audience are gonna read it because the presenter is going to read it and it's for the presenter to read. It's, it's their script rather than being up on the screen. So 10, 20, 30. So just say to anyone that's building presentations for you or you, you, you look at your own presentations and think, right, I'm gonna make all my font sizes 30 or larger. It will force you to have to distill the information down and just present the core information. And that's not my rule, by the way. That's a rule by Guy Kawasaki, who was, was one of the Apple investors. Uh, Charts. We love charts, don't we? What do we do with something like this? Because it has to be there because it's linked to an Excel sheet. It's dynamic. It changes. It's got ODBC, so we have to keep it in there. So it has to stay. But how do you make something like this 
look completely different. It's great numbers. We want the information. So this is a before. What we've done to it, frankly, is just remove the tick lines. The tick lines in the back screen PowerPoint, which are those grid lines in the back. And if we animate it slightly by introducing it by series, it changes it dramatically. And you end up with something like this. Same chart, just presented slightly differently. Yeah, going from sort of very PowerPointy look and feel to changing it over. And who doesn't love to have a millennial on their slide? Yeah, so just you know, use an image if you can, break it down and put it on there. Now, that's the sort of stuff that we teach people, but this is the sort of stuff we produce because the challenge here is to show scale. So it's quite difficult to go from that to that. But in actual fact, all we've done there is use the push animation to push the transition between one to show the scale. But then it gets really complicated once we start doing stuff like this. So here we're trying to show scale. And you know, we're one of 300 companies around the world who feed back to Microsoft. So we say to Microsoft, we want to be able to do this, please. Oh, okay, so that's one PowerPoint slide which has been animated, yeah, so that's not a Excel, but hopefully in Excel and in, in PowerPoint they're going to start allowing us to do this. So that's what you can do when you start bringing in animations to be able to show scale, which is one of the challenges we have. Here again, uh, something for some of the, using some of the graphical elements, so that's a list of bullet points and we turned it into what's called an icon array. So I mentioned earlier about using images. So we're using many images against each text point essentially. Use a big image in the background and it becomes way more engaging. Now what I actually wanted was the, um, this, uh, this hook to bring this piece of text in. So when we're working on something like that, because the eye is drawn to any sort of small movement. So I'll show you an example of something like this with some interesting numbers that are no longer true, obviously. I'm leaving there this morning. So I wanted the baggage to move around on the carousel there, but just in terms of presenting it. But here we kind of decided to add a little animation there. So ask yourself, is that engaging? Does it draw your eye to it? So it's just about trying to make it more fun. And those and animated infographics are coming to you in Office 365, which is on its way all the time. You know, so it's improving all the time. So there's a whole range of different elements. So in summary, those are my top 10 tips. Any questions on any of those? 4x4 four four and 6x6 six six has nothing to do with off-roading. It's no more than four lines of four words or six lines of six words on a slide is ideal. So try to minimize it. You can use the 30 font, font size as an example. Try to use more infographics. Bottom line figures only. Is that possible for you guys? Maybe not. <laughs> we're not after the whole dense data. Yeah, we're after the bottom line figures only. Yeah. If you have to present really dense information, hyperlink to Excel and present in Excel. Why not? Why do we always feel the need to bring Excel over into PowerPoint? If it's really dense, present it in Excel. Yeah, so it's just a case of, you know, we're after the big numbers. Fading animations is something we like. Try to get rid of the uh, bullets and use icons. And don't be afraid to bring some more media in. Use an image, yeah? If, you're, if your business is about people, then have pictures of people in there. People, humans like to look at humans, you know? So in terms of connecting. Any questions on any of that? Any thoughts before I come up to wrap up? No. Nope. Cool. Just some ideas for you. Cool. Where can you find out more? Well, I've, there's got a great conference coming up, a worldwide conference called presenttosucceed.com, which is coming up uh, in April on my birthday. So it's, uh, it's going to be a cool conference. It's based out of Europe, presenttosucceed.com, and it's going to have a whole range of this type of stuff, data visualization. Um, so I've been talking about data visualization, by the way, today. is essentially one of the subjects that I've been talking about. Nancy Duarte has a book. Uh, called Data Story, and it's free to download, and it's absolutely awesome if you're into presenting data. That's called Data Story, um, and it's in, it's in the links that are in the slides, which I'll make sure you get a copy of. Um, and yeah, obviously, we'd love to help you as well. We're based in Queenstown, and we're, we're very keen to get involved. So don't be afraid to disrupt and change the norm. We looked at different, you know, do something different. Yeah, try to something different, and this is the formula that most people use when they put a presentation together yeah and we want to toss that out of the way and we want to try and work on the content work on the delivery but also work on the audience engagement yeah so we have a whole range of audience engagement tools why couldn't you have a quiz around your annual reports yeah who thinks we hit you know blah blah and everybody votes on it do a kahoot you know why not you could do something completely different try to think about different ways of the meeting and how you're meeting and how you're connecting with them 
and that's our formula for audience alive. So in the last 16 seconds, I'd like to say that if you think about it, you don't get a newspaper, you get news. You don't really get glasses, you get vision. You don't really get a mattress, you get sleep. And you don't really get a lamp, you get light. Well, if you use presentology, you're not really getting a presentation, you're getting applause. Thank you very much. So, if you like the information, that's my uh, QR code. QR codes have gone crazy, haven't they? So, you just grab your phone and you can scan that QR code or just make a note of that URL. And there's loads of free stuff on there. Data, there's, there's a great book in there, by the way, called Saying It with Charts, um, which was a really useful one of the sort of books that sort of switched me over from too much data and showed people how to take charts and make it more interesting. So, Saying It with Charts is a great book, but there's lots of assets there um, if you'd like to grab them at any point. Thank you very much.